Welcome to a very special episode of the Corporate Real Estate Insider Podcast. We have two awesome guests joining the pod today. First is Sarah Anderson. She's head of real estate and workplace effectiveness at Genentech. We're so excited to ask her a bunch of questions and get to know her a little bit better. Uh, we also have Michelle Quinn, who is a partner of ours uh, in our San Francisco office. And she is uh, the person who's introduced us to Sarah. They've been longtime friends. Uh, and we're really uh, excited to dive in. So jumping right into the podcast today, Sarah, when we were talking in advance of uh, hopping on and recording today, uh, Brian, Owen, John, and I were really interested in this part of your title, right? Head of real estate, which we see you know, a lot of, but then also, and workplace effectiveness. So we really want to understand what does that mean to you? What is workplace effectiveness all about? How does that relate to being head of real estate. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your role at Genentech uh, and how the second part of your title specifically plays into that? So thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, in terms of uh, real estate and workplace effectiveness, I have to give credit to Ann Bamsberger for the workplace effectiveness title. She was the original head of workplace effectiveness at Genentech, started in 2013. Um, and what we mean by workplace effectiveness is we think that real estate and workplace can be used as a tool for the business. So um, that lots of traditional real estate and workplace metrics, cost per square foot, cost per head, those are table stakes in our industry. We should all be able to hit the right numbers. But how are we helping the business? So we want to measure our effectiveness in terms of business outcomes. Um, and we look at it with what's now fairly common in the in industry across three pillars. So you have place, you have technology, and you have social. And for us, social means agreements. So we have team agreements. You have agreements at your, you know, all sorts of levels, your team, your department, your org, cross-functional teams, et cetera. And um, those agreements allow your work to be more effective and for you to achieve your outcomes. So let me give you an example. Uh, several years ago, we were doing a uh, filing and a filing is a very stressful um, period of time. And it tends to burn people out um, and then they leave and then they, you know, you've got to teach somebody all over again. And we had uh, a filing happening and both through the adjacencies in the building, like the, all the different groups that were in the building and the way we configured the workplace, they were able to file faster. What used to take two weeks, they were able to do in an afternoon. Basically, they all agreed when the FDA communication comes in, everybody swarms to this one neighborhood, safety goes into the conference room, which has glass walls, so they can motion to those who are outside to bring them in. Regulatory turns around in their seats and talk. so basically they were solving things faster. And as you could imagine, you know, an afternoon versus two weeks makes a difference. So they ended up filing six weeks faster than they'd ever filed before. Is that all they'll do to us? Nope. But we were a part of it. We were a part of the solution. So for us, that is workplace effectiveness. It's so interesting, right? I mean, I think the, the idea of integrating uh, effectiveness of the workplace with all of the other things that you've described as table stakes uh, with also the real estate process is something that requires a lot of coordination. Uh, it's something that uh, I believe most companies recognize is really important, but the vast majority fail to execute on. And we've talked about this a lot on uh, various episodes of the podcast is that our observation of a lot of uh, large companies, you know, which Genentech, obviously really large company, over 10,000 employees, been around for almost 50 years now. Um, you know, you start thinking about the typical company and it sounds like the way Genentech handles its real estate is uh, really integrated, really holistic, very sophisticated and, and well executed. The vast majority of companies we find are actually doing a, um, a pretty bad job uh, or a, a mediocre job at even table stakes. So I'd love to understand, Sarah, from your perspective, how did Genentech get to where it is today in terms of the integration and sophistication of its real estate delivery, because being able to focus on on workplace effectiveness is almost a, a, a luxury, right, to many companies. I mean, there's some directors of real estate that listen to this podcast that are um, short-staffed, that don't have enough time in the day, 
that are just uh, reactively and urgently running around trying to solve for leases that are expiring imminently going, oh my gosh, if we don't get this lease renewed or don't find a new location, then we're going to be in a position where, you know, truly we don't have space for our team. So how did, how did Genentech get into this position of being able to play offense and be so strategic versus being reactive as a lot of the, you know, call it Fortune 500 real estate departments of today are? Uh, that's a good question, frankly. And um, I need to give, again, credit to others who sort of came before me. Um, and one thing is over the years, we are a majority owned portfolio. So we own, at this point, we own 92% of our portfolio. So that means that we are not at, um, we're not at risk with leases. You know, we are primarily South San Francisco. We're over 200 acres in South San Francisco, about 60 buildings. Um, we do have other sites in the U.S. and those are leased, but they're, it's small. And, um, you know, and I will, to be very fair, I will say we're in a reactive place right now for R&D that we need to build labs quickly because that's where our growth is. Um, but I would say that the secret to the success for the most part was this focus on the business and the business outcomes so that we have people on our team and we are very fortunate to have an, you know good internal team. We are not short staffed. Um, that partners with the business. They are, in effect, you know, workplace strategy partners. Um, and we have been a people who are very good at change management. Frankly, we have people who are good at that spectrum of workplace strategy all the way through to change management. And their role is to understand what the business is trying to achieve in the next year, three years, five years, and then come back and we are, you know, what do we need to do from a real estate and workplace point of view to achieve that. Um, so that's really been uh, very helpful that we have the the trust and the partnership of the business. That's very, very uh, interesting. And, and, um, and understanding that relationship, it's just so interesting on how it evolved. Does those CRMs, other clients I've had w with similar positions, uh, they use the term CRM, so I'll use that. But do they sit in a real estate organization or do they sit in the uh, business or operations team? Uh, so they sit within our team, within real estate and workplace effectiveness. And I'll give you an example of one. So we have um, R&D. We have uh, pharma technical who make the drugs. So R&D, they find the molecules. Pharma technical, they make the drugs. Product development, they actually figure out the you know, dosage. Actually, basically, they figure out the indications, et cetera. And then we have commercial, medical, and government affairs. So, and then we have GNA. But so there's a partner for each one of those major business units. And for example, Pharma Technical is a very complex organization. You have global manufacturing, which manages our commercial manufacturing organizations and, and our own manufacturing. Um, you have local manufacturing. And until last year, we actually produced commercially available drugs in South San Francisco. Um, you also have development. So actually, how do we take this molecule and make it into a drug that is safe for humans? And how do we scale production of the, this medicine? And I took a risk. I felt like it would be easier to hire somebody from that group and teach them what they needed to know about real estate and workplace than trying to teach somebody from the outside of all about pharma technical. I was just baldly lucky as hell. This person is fantastic. And, you know, she came to us from the client and he recommended, you know, he recommended her and she has an innate understanding of client service of under, you know, about where something can be solved by an agreement when um, we all have this, that people come to us with solutions. They say, you know, Hey, Brian, I need 50,000 square feet for X, Y, and Z. And you say, okay, let's back up. Let's talk about what you're trying to solve before we jump to that one solution, because then we can, there's, there could be seven other solutions that might be better. So this person has this wonderful ability to innately, she gets that. And because she understands the manufacturing side of the business and the development side of the business, she's able to really help. Sarah, can you talk a little bit about the, the real estate process? I mean, it sounds like you were going into a little bit of it there. Uh, you know, if a, 
if a, a client, which I assume in you know the, the context of this conversation is a business unit or you know end user group within Genentech, if they come to the real estate team and say, "Hey, we have this need," how does how does it go from there? How do you take their needs, analyze what they are, and ultimately move them into space? Like walk us through that whole process. Uh, how you make it happen. There's a couple examples I have here. Um, I'm going to use an older one. Uh, so first of all, the internal partner on our side will come to back to the team and say there is this need. Uh, so we have a group within Genentech called Access Solutions. They are, I hope never, I hope people, none of you or anybody you care about ever need our drugs. But if you do, once the prescription um, has been written, this group will reach out to the patient and help them do you know how to access the medicine? Do you know how to navigate your insurance? Are you adequately insured? Do you need secondary insurance? Are you uninsured? All right, well, let's let's hook you up with a foundation for your disease or the Genentech Foundation. So the work they do is really important. They work with patients, providers, and payers. Um, but the work practices of the majority of this workforce is that of a call center. And they were in South San Francisco in a lease facility. And we went to have a conversation with them to say, hey, listen, it's 2016, your lease is up in 2019. Um, just want to double check, is this something that you want to be doing here? Non-revenue generating. Really, really important, but non-revenue generating. Um, that, that works. So they said, yeah, let's think about this. So just from a real estate point of view, we ran some numbers on labor and real estate. It's cheaper to do this in Phoenix. Shocker, right? So we present it and it's like, well, is that really the solution that this is the business, like having this conversation with us? Like, actually, what we think is if we move the whole thing to Phoenix, first of all, we lose that Genentech connection, the connection to our patients. If you guys ever come to our campus, we have huge patient banners hanging on the outside of our buildings. We are so mission focused and that helps us keep like We talk about the patients in the room and, um, so anyway, we decided what's really more, the business decided what's really most important is business continuity. So let's look at just setting up a second site. And so from our, our team, we said, okay, well, one way we can give you immediate business continuity is flexible work. Could a portion of your workforce work from home? And so we did a remote working pilot with them and it was very prescriptive. Um, this is 2017 and for them. It had to, they had to have a certain rating in their review and they had to have a certain bandwidth on there. Actually no different than this podcast. Your wife had to be a certain level, your, <laughs> your sound and, and uh, video quality at a certain level. Um, can't have dogs or small children, that kind of thing. Anyway, we start this pilot while we start the real estate search. We end up, you know, um, I'm talking to experts in this area, you know what site selection looks like. And so we went through that whole thing and we landed in Portland. But meanwhile, the remote work pilot, 20% more call volume because this work you can measure. There's not lots of, you know, work you can't measure. So the 20% more call volume, the first people to raise their hands say, yes, we can work overtime, et cetera. So they got the immediate business continuity by that. But then we established them in Portland as well. Um, and I, if you will indulge me, this group actually led to the most rewarding day of my career. When I was up in uh, Portland with them for the soft launch, um, I ran into a gentleman. So I was very involved in the beginning of the project, but then other people kind of took it over as to, to, to implement it. And I ran to this gentleman, Mason, and I hadn't seen him in a bit. I'm like, oh my gosh, did you reload up to Portland? He's like, yes. And my wife works at Solution, Access Solutions. And she came up and we're so excited. We're closing on a house tomorrow because Portland is so much more affordable. Um, and then just then his wife came in, or I guess I saw him the next day, his wife came in and she was holding that little baggie that had the house keys and the garage door opener. And I was so proud. It's, this is this, you know, this group that helps our patients, you know, and, and they're so impactful. And we were able, from a real estate point of view, from a workplace point of view, to help these people to make a difference in their lives. So anyway, that was a, it was, so that's what we do. And that was, that's a, a really good example. Yeah, that's, it's really cool to be able to see everything that you're working on uh, manifest itself physically and see the impact firsthand with people that you know and care about. Uh, 
having this uh, call center end up in Portland uh, is really interesting, right? Uh, all of us do a lot of this uh, national site selection work, whether it be for call centers or for large manufacturing projects. You think like a you know Gigafactory style type project, like those types of things. And when you think of site selection uh, and uh, government incentives, things like that, you do not think, okay, this is going to Portland. So I, I love to understand a little bit more, like what went into the decision to select Portland? I'm sure there were a lot of reasons, um, probably notably balancing uh, connection to Genentech, quality of life versus like, hey, let's just pick the cheapest possible spot in the country that we can do this, which normally that's not a, a winning strategy. So We'd love to get a better sense of how that decision was made. Sure. So we did the traditional site selection. We, here's our criteria in terms of labor and the type of labor. And we want our workforce to reflect our patient population. And as you are aware, you know, disease does not discriminate, unfortunately. Um, so uh, I think we are we had top 10 and Portland was not in top 10. Um, I think we were, you know, so we're kind of like, is it Boise? No, Boise is not a cultural fit. Is it Austin? Yeah, time zone difference might be a bit of a challenge. It's a little far. Um, and we, so in this meeting um, was the CEO of Genentech because the CEO of Genentech is also the head of the commercial organization and Access Solutions is part of the commercial organization. And um, the head of Access Solutions um, and, you know, we're having this conversation and we keep coming back to Hillsborough, Oregon, Hillsborough, Oregon. There's already a pin in the map in Hillsborough, Oregon. We have a manufacturing site there. So I was able to say, okay, I'm hearing a, a, an emotional connection to Hillsborough, not a financial, an emotional connection. Are we? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Just want to make sure I want to be really explicit about this because it's not going to be the least expensive option. So we look at the Hillsboro. Unfortunately, Hillsboro um, is lovely, and this could be different now, but then um, doesn't have a lot of infrastructure around where we the office would be. And these the people who work in this office don't get a ton of time. So small example, but Chipotle. Chipotle is a 10-minute walk away. You've got 30 minutes for lunch. You got to walk to Chipotle. You got to grab your lunch. Company. It just, it just didn't work. So that's what led us to Portland. So they could be close to Hillsboro. We had some synergies there, but it was, um, you know, we, we needed a more, a more urban environment to support the workforce. The anecdote was fantastic that, you know, a six week project down to whatever it was a week or less. And if workplace effectiveness is the goal, is the target. Have you found, is there a way to empirically, you know, evaluate your sites so that one is crushing it in terms of workplace effectiveness or one is falling short? Like, what do you, what, what can you measure or how, how do you do that? Yes, this is the crux. <laughs> um, so when we go into any engagement with a client group, um, we start with, you know, what, a, what are you trying to achieve as a business? And then we ask them, how are they measuring their, like, how will they know when they succeed? So we try to be, you know, we call them operating um, or like conditions of ownership, being very concrete about the what and the why, and let, let you know, the group determine the how. So what are you trying to achieve? Why are you trying to achieve it? And how are you going to know when you succeed? What are the success criteria? So we set those up, but then we measure our success with the business. So even though we're, it's, it's a leap, right? It's a leap. We, the, that filing team that filed six weeks faster, that's the people. We created the, the conditions for success, but so it's, a, it's a definitely a leap. And we don't, again, we don't have that many sites that we are doing this. We actually are getting closer to our Basel colleagues and we are becoming more part of Roche all the time, which is a really wonderful thing. And so they, while they're not set up exactly the way we are, there's enough similarities that we can say, okay, how are you guys solving for this? Okay, you know, so um, we don't have a, uh, when you're asking about site to site, how is one crushing it versus the other? It's, um, it has more to do with the business and so it's the real estate or workplace, if that's you know, a site that might be super impactful and effective, might be a manufacturing site that 
they're really doing the majority of the work on the floor. And it's not a site where we have a lot of influence, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense uh, and is interesting to understand how you think through it. One thing that really strikes me as you have explained these, you know, different stories, these different, you know, interesting moments in time uh, in your career and Genentech and how these decisions are made, um, it's just how significantly the role of a director of real estate has changed, right? Um, if you think back to what it meant to be a director of real estate 10 or 20 years ago, I feel like that role really was more of a head of transactions type of role, right? Um, and today being a director of real estate, at least the most challenging parts from what we hear from, you know, all of our friends and colleagues and clients and, you know, different esteemed guests that we have on the podcast like you, right, is that that is actually the the easy side. And that the and, and not to say that it's unimportant because obviously it's incredibly important. There's where rubber meets the road where, you know, tens or hundreds or billions of dollars is spent on rent or in terms of operating expenses on owned facilities and all that. But the the really challenging part of being a director of real estate is is what you're talking about, is how do you get the information from the di different business units, get that information, validate that it's correct, figure out what they're trying to accomplish and make sure that the real estate lines up with the business objectives of that particular unit of the company. And... Um, Many people that listen to this podcast are directors of real estate that um, you know might be uh, earlier in their career or less experienced than than you are at you know leading such a, a large dynamic company. And I, I would ask, like Sarah, what advice would you offer to those people in terms of how do you step into this director of real estate role of today versus ten years ago? How how can people improve at getting that information out of the company? And then being able to go implement these solutions that are really custom tailored to what the business needs. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think part of it has to do with um, creating trusted relationships. I mean, this is something you guys know, like the back of your hand. Um, there is a lot of, uh, well, it's just space. Like we just need six more, like, we need to see six more people and it's just space. And um, leveraging influence, leadership influence, you know, so you have some, you have leaders who you've worked with and, um, and you may have been sponsored by somebody. You may have been sponsored by another executive in, within Genentech who says, oh, you know, hey, so-and-so, yeah, talk to Sarah, she can help you or talk to Sarah's team, they can help you. Um, and, uh, frankly, um, we all learned a ton, you know, from 2020 to 2022 when we were, you know, work from home for, and then those of us who could not be work from home, like Genentech, a lot of Genentech, um, how do you work on site, et cetera. We had a complete company-wide, Genentech-wide, because we are part of Roche, a complete Genentech-wide future of working. Let's revisit what it means for us to work and how we're going to move forward. And our team facilitated those conversations across the company, which gave us a lot of street cred. So I think that is, uh, so, you know, my advice would be the company with, you know, where you're going to be working, how do they feel about real estate and workplace? Do they think it's just, is it transactional to them? Is it a commodity or do they, it's a huge line on the PL. It's right after payroll. You know, and we're spending a lot of money on it. So let's make it work for us. But do they believe that? And if the leadership believes that, then they will sponsor you with the business unit leaders to help. I've got another question or, or maybe an observation. It sounds like you do both the transactional piece, as Tucker was describing, and with a focus on delivering the workplace effectiveness. It's always been interesting to me when companies separate those roles and you have distinct individuals um one person handling transactions, another person handling workplace, and the relationship between those two. Um, and is it symbiotic or is it, or, you know, does the workplace person, are they invited to a seat at the table in the transaction phase so that they can influence the decisions that are being made or do they get, get it handed after the fact? Like, I just, that becomes critical to the, how those two teams interact. And it's surprising. It, it, it seems the best approach is to have the same person doing both as you, as you're doing. 
Um, because the minute you separate them, you need this, these two people to be really, really, um, aligned. And I just wonder if you, is that intentional? Um, have you had the experience of the, the alternative where you've got one role or not the other? Um, or do you have any thoughts on when those roles were separated? So, uh, it's interesting. The, I do have a real estate, a real estate strategy team who does handle, you know, our leasing our acquisitions our land acquisitions. They're really, really good. And then I have another team that is the one that leads the client focus teams also really, really good. Um, so the people who lead the client, we have, we call them squads who client focus squads, people who lead the client focus squads come back and they're almost like account executives that would come back into, you know, a, a brokerage house or say, here's all the lines of service I need for my client. I need site selection. I need construction. I need whatever it is. So, um, we will that so that client focus team comes back and says we need to lease something or we need this and then works closely with the transactions team on on the, like we have um we acquired a company in new york a tiny tiny footprint um and it was really fun actually i happened to be in new york touring schools with my son and i told our leasing guy i was like hey listen i'll be in new york let me know if you need me to do anything he's like well if you're going to be there can you tour this group around a couple sites and so my son and i toured nyu in the morning in the afternoon we were touring this com this genentech company that was founded by three nyu professors because nyu was like yes our professors are all still involved in industry it's like well actually they are here we go but you know it was just uh they need the they need the real estate. Let's figure out. And then the transaction team works with the client focus squad to talk about what is the um what's the term? You know, how how certain are we about this? Are they gonna be in New York for five years and then we're bringing them back to, to San, South San Francisco? What's so that's that sort of back and forth happens and then do we think they're gonna grow and are they gonna grow in New York? Okay, let's make sure we secure right of first refusal on the rest of the floor. So that's you know, so the um, within my team, we have the voice of the client and the transaction expertise. Um, and what's also funny is the people who lead those those uh, two teams. The feedback to the head of real estate strategy is, I would really like you to learn more about the voice of the client. And the feedback to the guy who's voice of the client is, I would really like you to learn more about real estate finance and transactions. Um, try to make everybody as as. Uh, uh, cross functional as possible. So interesting that uh, relationship between real estate and the client, and uh, how do you get the client who, you know, a lot of times their their sole focus is on, and it should be on the delivery of whatever product they're trying to deliver, and how do you align that with a real estate, uh, the realities of real estate, right? Because uh, sometimes there's constraints, sometimes there's better opportunities. Um, and, you know, real estate's physical. It's not something that you can invent in a lab. It's there or it isn't. And uh, I'm just curious, as, you know, as you built this organization and you've modified your organization, how important is, is experience within Genentech? Uh, I think you touched on it earlier, but I'm having a client right now that's kind of looking at how they're shaping their organization in that the piece between the business units who um, a lot of times they want what they want. And my, at least my experience is, is they typically get what they want. Um, but also having someone with the experience of the company, the culture, and some real estate experience to be able to help shape that in a way that's um, accretive or, or beneficial or cross-functional or something that isn't just solely focused on that one need at the time. Uh, I, I, my opinion is that having relationships within the organization that you've built over time uh, is more important than technical expertise on on um, either the business or on real estate. It's really having people trust you that you're helping them, even if they don't believe you know what they know or as or as experienced as they are. You still have a long history of of a relationship and trust in that role. I'm curious on your thoughts on that, on how it works within your organization. It's interesting because I definitely think it's a both and. There are some business units where it's really helpful to have somebody who's got real estate or workplace knowledge, has got some sort of design level knowledge. There are some client groups 
where you have to build the trust by delivering of delivering again and again and again on the smallest things to larger things that they will, you will do what you say you're going to do and you will deliver for them. Um, we used to, I think, over rotate on like, we're not order takers, you know, we're not just going to do what they tell us to do. We even had a manifesto. It's like, we're going to give them what they don't even know that they need or want. And, and, um, it was good and it was a little academic. Um, and we got a little bit of reputation for being arrogant. I had to fix, I had a course correct on that. But, um, you know, when you build that trust, whether it's through some client groups, it's you've built the trust through just delivering again and again. So when you built that trust, then you can say, so what I'm hearing is you need X, Y, and Z. Can you help me understand the business challenge that you're trying to solve with X, Y, and Z? And they'll tell you. And you can say, okay, I said, understand what you're trying to do. Yeah, let's do that. Or let's back up a little bit more and let's, you know, what you may not be aware of is that this business unit is doing this and this business unit is doing this. And if we combine your needs, we could actually do something that's more symbiotic or more effective. So it's our job to connect to the dots across the business. Um, and there, you know, so it's some client groups, um, I'll, you know, for a period of time, I was short staffed and I was stepping into a role and it was the first time I was meeting with the commercial organization and the person who led that group happened to be a dad that I know. We used to be at morning circle together, elementary school, you know? So he walks in, he gives me a big hug in front of his LT. I get immediately like, okay, Jonathan trusts her. Therefore she is trustworthy. So, you know, that's the, the, the sponsorship. Um, so it's that it's depending, and you guys all know this. We don't deal with clients the same way. Clients, you have to look at the client, understand their profile, understand you know are they, you know, not just um, what's the company culture, but also what's the individual makeup of the people. Um, and so, do they? Are we going to get their trust by just delivery? Or are we going to get their trust by, frankly, showing how what our expertise is? So it's it's a, it's definitely a both and. Um, and, uh, and we learn and have to adjust all the time. Yeah. It's so it's so interesting, right? Tucker, you said earlier that, you know, real estate, um, the function of the uh, directors of real estate before was, or in, in previous kind of early iterations was more transactional and they've kind of grown out of that. I think, uh, part of it is that they realized that there's a portion of the business that you can outsource to competent and capable people like ourselves. And as a part of the business, you cannot, and you can never, I've sat in that role. Like I've had clients years ago that have had their, uh, members of their real estate team leave. They needed to fill roles. Like you were saying, short staff. So I've sat in the, the, um, kind of seconding charge for a company for a year. And I just didn't, I was not effective because I wasn't part of the organization. I wasn't on their team. I didn't carry their badge. I was a contractor in the chair and. Uh, that's a part of the business you just can't outsource, right? You need somebody that is either grown up in the business with you, or at least you can, you know, you see at the water cooler on, on a regular basis. So it's, um, I think, I think companies have gotten a lot smarter on how they've, they've realized where third party, um, vendors and partners can be effective and where real estate organizations need to focus their talent and, and bring organizations together with really strong talent like yourself that is effective at doing what nobody else can do within an organization. You've got to be on the ground doing it every day. So that's great. Thank you. Yeah, well, you'd also see the pendulum swing from insourcing to outsourcing to insourcing to outsourcing, right? I mean, it just happens. At least I, that's what I've seen. And, um, you know, the benefit of outsourcing is theoretical. You can build, you know, um, staff augmentation or then, st you know, but then you run, you lose the um, institutional knowledge. So we've got Brian on the team and then the work dies down. We say, okay, Brian, thanks. We're good for now. And then the work comes, you know, another bowls of works comes in like, Hey, can we get Brian? They're like, no, he's at another client now. So you lose, you know, it's like you're, you're restarting every time. And the real challenge for us is how big is that team? How big is that internal team? You want to right size that for, sort of what the level of work is. Um, and that's always a challenge, I think. Sarah, I want to go back to um, something you said earlier, which is that Genentech owns most of their real estate, uh, which makes sense. Um, you know, many biotech companies, many that we serve here at Hughes Marino, um, 
choose to own just because it gives them complete control of their facilities, which is particularly important in the pharmaceutical industry, as you know, which where specialized lab spaces, manufacturing, et cetera, you know, have all sorts of regulatory needs and specific operational needs that they have to adhere to. So having control of that real estate can make a big difference. Um, but question for you, because as many biotech companies have to endure ebbs and flows of the industry, um, and given especially the rapid pace of change that um, exists in biotech, uh, I, how are you ensuring that your these own facilities, which seems to be a majority of your portfolio, remain flexible and adaptable to meet the future needs? Um, this is a question that I think a lot of directors of real estate um, at other big pharma, big biotech companies might be interested in hearing the answer. And like, to the extent that you can share, of course, you know, what are some of the strategies or examples that uh, Genentex uh, introduced or is um, embracing to future-proof these sites that you own to accommodate these shifts in the industry, which is could be demand, it could be research needs, it could be technological advancements like we're ex experiencing right now with AI. Um, so the extent you can elaborate on that, that'd be great to know because we have a lot of clients that like Genentech own a majority of the portfolio um, and how you're keeping those things nimble would be, be great to hear. Way to expose the soft white underbelly, Owen. Nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> it's hard. We have, you know, we, Tucker mentioned that we are almost 50 years old and it is a job of my team. I just went through a presentation recently. Where we were talking about, okay, here's our facilities. Here's, here's how many, here's a map of our campus. Here's how many are 40 plus years old or 30 plus years old or 20 plus years old or whatever it is. Um, so, you know, we, routinely go through our portfolio and understand uh, when we're going to make investments in renovation, we look at, you know, what what can the, the infrastructure that holds us back? You know, we have two very large um, research facilities and like, there's just no more room at the end, you know, and, and, um, and the, inf the backbones, the, you know, the infrastructure backbone can handle what we need to do next. Um, so we are in, in the planning phase of investment in, um, in research and investment in development. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I'm separating those because we do have our R and D group at the technical development also. So that basically, and what I think is also interesting is our investment is focused in place-based work. You can't do drug discovery in your kitchen. You can't make drugs in your garage. And we're not talking about Walter White. Um, you know, these are things that can only happen um, at a facility. So what we are doing right now is experimentation. So we did a renovation within our development labs where, um, we, there was a lot of duplication in our development labs, which worked very well for us during COVID because then we had a number of places where the work could happen. We didn't have to worry about, um, social distancing, but from an efficiency point of view, that's not great. So then we've built a lab, um, and they're calling it the co-lab. It's very clever. Uh, where they take the groups that had their own labs and bring them into one lab. And in, I don't know if you guys are also with lean manufacturing, um, but handoffs are where most of the waste occurs. So when you put purification and I'm forgetting the other names of the groups, uh, cell culture, whatever, when you put those people in the same lab, you're eliminating those handoffs. So it's one lab, we're going to see how it works and we're measuring it. Um, and that's also interesting in the way we, you know, we do, we're fortunate enough to have um, a really good infrastructure of sensors and badge data, et cetera. So for our shared, all of our shared office environments, we know how they're being used. But in labs, you don't measure utilization the same way because I could come in, start an experiment on a machine. I could leave. There's no longer a body in the lab, but that machine is still working. So that's not really available. So how do we start to look at utilization? Um, so we're doing those experiments. And the, the so working with that client group, how are they measuring success? How are we measuring success? So we're doing that. Um, we are going to complete this year the tenant improvement build out of a leased lab facility. And it's the first all electric lab facility in Northern California. So it's exciting and interesting and new for us. Um, and literally there is a list of experiments that R and D is trying in terms of how they set up. They're doing, they're putting all their core labs together. 
Um, and they're doing that to create a programmatic destination. Scientists need to use those core labs. And so that's going to force them to come out of their lab and go to the core lab and cross paths with others. They're doing other experiments on um, certain, like how they set up certain things. And then we have things that we're doing on the workplace side that we're experimenting. And we're being very, uh, we're putting a lot of rigor around what are we trying to learn? How are we measuring? And then when are we going to decide this is like a time box in it? So all of this to inform investment, you know, real estate takes a long time. Real estate, the lead time on real estate is far longer than anything else we're doing. So we're trying to, you know, and frankly, when you're planning a new R&D facility, by the time it comes out of the ground, it's already out of date. So we're doing a lot of the same things in terms of flexible chassis and the ceiling and pull downs. And, and um, you know, there's a company that was offering um, I'm not going to mention names, but like spec suites, you know, spec lab suites. And, um, and it's a hosted lab facility for startups. Like, yeah, we can change labs in 48 hours. And I'm like, oh, really? What are you doing? I can't do it. <laughs> but I was super intrigued. Um, and frankly, there's a spectrum of flexibility and cost. The more flexible, the more it costs because you're putting so much infrastructure in there. And how do you hit that right balance? So, you know, my, my answer is what we're trying to do now is while we plan our investments is do experiments and be rigorous about them. Did you learn anything? Just curious, because we've got a lot of those, um, you know, those interchangeable spec lab companies here in Cambridge. And just curious if any of, and a lot of those are kind of lower end, kind of your, your startup type companies that have a very generic lab curious if if there was anything that you could have taken from how they um try to produce their product into the marketplace that you thought was uh, something you could apply within your own labs that are probably much more expensive and higher end and uh more sophisticated what i learned is i don't understand <laughs> <laughs> what I learned is I came back to the people who actually do the infrastructure in the labs. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So da, 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 da. And they're like, OK, and here's why those things won't work. You know, our benches are this and here's why they're this. And our exhaust is this. And here's why it, it has their specific infrastructure requirements for our science. And it, the generic, which needs to basically fit the Venn diagram of many companies. Right. We are not that. Um but, you know, one of the things that uh, we're doing now that I find so interesting and uh, Dr. Aviv Regev, who is the head of R&D for Genentech, and she was Bro Broad Institute at MIT, um, uh, talks about lab in a loop. So originally we have these computational scientists who are creating the wet lab in software. And so they have to be adjacent to the wet labs because when you're building something, whether it's in the real world or the a physical world, you need to go in and out and understand what the, um, the workflows are, et cetera. And then um, in traditional wet lab science, you can go very deep on a molecule or shallow but broad. Computational science allows us to do both. And um, it's going to get to a place, I'm, not, I'm like a, not even a hundredth as articulate on this as she is, and I urge all of you to look her up. She is amazing. Um, but talking about, you know, now, computational science is going to tell us what experiments to do on certain molecules. And then we'll do those experiments and then put the data into the, into the back in. And then it's going to, it goes back and forth. And so you're able to exponentially speed up drug discovery. And that's the only way we're going to do it. We have to do things faster. Sarah, something that I'm really curious about and understanding that Genentech's in a unique spot because... Uh, as you said earlier, when you're, you know, uh, working in labs, you have to physically be in a lab. There's not a, you know, work from home option for, you know, all of the laboratory scientists at Genentech and other people that work in these labs. But just as someone that is really knowledgeable about real estate that, you know, closely follows what's happening, and I'm sure uh, you're friends with tons of other people that lead real estate for other large, sophisticated companies. What do you think about remote work, right? Like if it's a you know, more traditional uh, office-based company, how do you feel about it? Like, where do you think it's going to go? Do you think people have, uh, you know, over-indexed on work from home being okay? Do you think they've under-indexed? Like, what's your worldview on working from home, efficiency, gains, losses, and all that? 
Okay. So from Genentech point of view, we've been working flexibly, flexibly since 2014. So a portion of our workforce, you know, you opted in to, to, to our neighborhood program and then you had an agreement. So you work up to two days a week remotely and we agree you're going to be transparent about presence, et cetera. So um, we've, oh, at least in uh, basically what happened though, when we started this, if you were in a neighborhood, you could work flexibly. If you weren't, you couldn't. So in 2018, Genentech adopted a working flexibly philosophy, which was sporadically adopted. So, um, so it's, we've been doing it for a while and it's about flexibility and choice. Um, I, now we veer off of Genentech into the opinion of only Sarah Anderson, not the official opinion of Genentech at all. I think we've over rotated. Um, there is a contract when you have a job between the employer and the employee, you do the work and I pay you, it, you know, that's part of the job. And there's a gentleman, a uh, professor at, at Stanford, Nick Plume, and he's quoted in every article these days about distributed teaming and hybrid work. And he's very, very smart. And he brought up this um, statistic, which is you can't get a tea time on Friday anywhere anymore. <laughs> so how much work has really happened on Friday? And I'm sure there are those who will say that, you know, a round of golf is work and that could totally be. But um, we... Going back to officially Genentech, we have a majority of time on campus requirement. And the word mandate and Genentech, those two words did not go together. But we needed to mandate the vaccine. And we got a little more comfortable with, you know, you must have this. And, and you know, during, for that period of time, you needed vaccination as part of your employment, not just to come on campus. So... We are at 95% of our pre-pandemic attendance. And the conversation I've been having with Nick Bloom is uh, he's done study distributed teams for 20 years. It is really, really good information. I want to know about the intersection of place-based work and those who can work more flexibly. So John's in the lab and Tucker, you don't have, you're also an R&D, but you are, do not work in the lab. You, there's intersection between your work. I'm going to give you a quick example. When we brought our researchers back in June of 2020, one of the things that we discovered was in the lab, you get an unexpected result. And pre-pandemic, you would just go down the hall until you found somebody more senior and you grab them and say, I got this unexpected result. What do you think? And you talked it through. Well, you couldn't talk it through. So one of the solutions we developed was very basic. We rolled a monitor into the lab and we created, a, opened up a Google Hangout and then senior leaders would sign up for two hour shifts and then they would just be in that Hangout. So, you know, in the lab, you can turn around and be like, oh, hey, I got this result. What do you think? So there's an interaction between people that if you're not there, it gets harder and you have to be a lot more planful about it. So... I think remote working is here to stay. I think more rigor needs to be applied to it. And I think the pendulum is going to swing back to the middle. Yeah, it's funny. You, you quoted Nick Bloom. Did you see the article? And if, and if you didn't, uh, the, the Wall Street Journal had an article on this over the weekend. And he's quoted in saying that the value of working for from home on the retail sector, the online retail sector, is three, last year was $375 billion more money was spent online shopping because of the work from home phenomenon. It's, uh, it came out over the weekend and I saw his name and I had read some of his stuff before, but, um, he is, he's really deep into this. And then I went down a rabbit hole was reading some of his other research, but it's quote, it's we're spending billions on this work from home indulgence. I love the title, uh, cause I agree at, at certain times it does feel like it's an indulgence of, of, uh, putting, putting your own personal, uh, needs of of convenience ahead of that contract you signed with your employer i've got a question for you going back to the, the same comment that you can't do the work in the lab remote <clears throat> or can you i wonder on uh, what your team is discussing around the impact of ai uh, for the earliest stage drug discovery and the remarkable number of drug targets frankly that are going to be coming available and interesting needing to be investigated further. But that earliest phase of drug discovery, I think a significant portion of it is going to shift to compute. 
Are you folks talking about that? And do you agree? Absolutely. That's sort of what I was talking about earlier with the computational science. We have literally created a Genentech computational science team, and it is the fastest growing team within Genentech. Um, so it is happening. And frankly, research has been done in a distributed way for years and years. Um, but there's still components of the process that, and frankly, a lot of it is the, the bouncing things off of each other the poking holes, the, you know, and, and so um, the, uh, the indulgence, yes, I'll say that, you know, the days that I work from home is convenient for me, Sarah, I can get a lot of laundry done, I can hang out with my dog. But who am I not learning from that day? You know, I have the very great privilege of working for a company that saves lives. I also have the great, very great privilege of I am never the smartest person in any room in Genentech. I learn every single day. And you know, the days that I'm not there, who am I, who's not learning from me? Who am I not learning from? And that goes for all of us. Um, so we believe that campus is a, a magnet and, and a, um, it's a magnet for our people and it's a platform for innovation for now. Doesn't mean things won't change and they already have. This has been such an interesting thought. Um, uh, love your take on all of this. The, uh, can I shift to something else? I think we're getting close to time, and I just wanted to bring up this other thing. If I'm not mistaken, um, Michelle, thank you for introducing us to Sarah and getting us together with her on this pod. Am I correct that you've been a mentor for Michelle for some number of years? And and let's talk about that just briefly. I mean, how cool that you would do that, and how cool, Michelle, for you that you've had um, Sarah to give you some guidance and coaching and learning and wouldn't it be great if everybody could have a, a mentor like Sarah. So am I right? Have you been a mentor and kudos and just a quick <laughs> minute talking about that relationship. Thank you. And I get so glad I get to go first because then I get to say that it's absolutely been, um, it's been re like reverse mentorship at times. It is a very mutually beneficial relationship. Um, I met Michelle 12 years ago um, and I had, uh, was working at a client that I was on the design side so, um, and someone introduced me to Michelle and I learned more about that client in half an hour with Michelle than I had learned in the prior three months. And she was so informative and so helpful. And we ended up working together and it was fantastic. And you know, in this industry, when you meet somebody who's really good, you want to keep working with them. And so she and I stayed in touch, did a couple other projects together, and then she ended up shifting companies. And I remember talking to her and I was like, oh, wow, what about that client? You worked for them for so long. And she said, they've got six months that relationship me there and that I can go back. And I, I tell everybody who I meet with, you know, about Michelle and, and this story, because it's rare that you see a woman be that confident. And I'll even say cocky in work, in business. And I loved it. And then I, you know, I, I knew that she was an Olympic athlete. That might have a little bit to do with it. Um, but I loved that. And I took it like a, like a shot in the arm. Like, yes, let's do that. So, um, I carry a, a little bit of Michelle with me every time I go into a meeting where I feel like I need to impress. I am humbled by your response, Sarah. And trust me, the feeling is mutual. I have been beyond grateful for all the things that we've been through together. And, to your point, John, I am very, very fortunate to have Sarah in my life and a handful of other strong women in real estate is that it's not a surprise, particularly for brokerage, that this is a male-dominated industry. So as the pandemic dawned on me and my parents were saying, well, are you going to be selling furniture for 20 more years? I did make a career change from furniture to brokerage. I was like, I don't think that I am, but I don't know where I'm going to go. Sarah was the person that said, you should be a broker. You can do this. And it's a it's going to be a very short learning curve for you, but it has been a very steep learning curve, but one that I've incredibly enjoyed and couldn't have done without your encouragement. That's that's great. It's uh, it's great to hear um, stories like that. I was I'd be remiss not to mention I just purchased a book and I haven't read it yet, but her interview on CNBC last week. Uh, got me to order it on the spot. It was a woman by the name of Bonnie Hammer. She's an executive with NBC. And the book's called 15 Lies Women Are Told at Work and the Truth They Need to Succeed. And the story she told, which is pretty interesting, it doesn't sound like the relationship you, you both have, but her mentor was Barry Diller. If anyone knows Barry Diller, 
um, IAC, you know, a, um, a very successful billionaire. But she, uh, early on, she had a picture of him on her punching bag. And the only way she got through being his mentee was to go home and beat him up every night. So it was uh, obviously a very different time and a very different industry uh, at times, probably, Michelle. I don't know if you have, um, you know, maybe Kales or, or, or someone in the office is a uh, picture on your, uh, on your punching bag. But uh, it's a pretty, sounds like a really great book I just picked up and we'll have to talk about it on a later pod. I look forward to hearing about that. I will just, a uh, quick thing. I um, flew to New York last week for my sister's retirement party. I surprised her. She spent 40 years in corporate real estate in New York. She was with Hoda Swile, which is real estate consultancy. And it was pretty amazing. First to surprise her, which was really fun, but also um, to see there was probably 60 people at this party from all the places in her career, Bankers Trust, Deutsche Bank, you know, Credit Suisse, you know, Bank of Switzerland, uh, Hoda Swile. while. And then it was also wonderful to meet all these women who either had mentored Sue, my sister, or had, my sister had mentored. And um, it just spoke volumes. Uh, but I will say one thing that was really interesting is, uh, I mean, everyone talked about her energy level and how much she could accomplish. And her husband was telling this story about, like, she's always going, she's like, Sue, just sit down. She's like, I can't, I can't I'll fall asleep. And... <laughs> And he envies, like, when she goes to sleep within 10 minutes, she is out. Because, the, and there's a lot that women take on. And I think it's, this is absolutely in, a, in an evolving place. But her daughters were there. Um, you know, she raised two kids as a single mom while kind of, not kind of, while doing an amazing job in, you know, real estate in, the, in New York. And uh, a number of years ago, she was the... Uh, like WX, the Women Executive of the Year in New York, and she has a very strong network. Um, and, you know, now that she's retired, she's been retired since March 31st, she's on three boards, um, and she knows wakes up at 6.30 versus 5.30. So, you know, baby steps. But uh, it was pretty amazing to be there and see and hear all the stories from all these different colleagues over the years. Retired. That's awesome. Uh, clearly, uh, being uh, excellent real estate professionals run in the Anderson family. So uh, glad glad to hear that. And Sarah uh, and Michelle, just sincerely thank you for coming on the podcast. This has been awesome. So many interesting learnings that uh, I'm excited to share with all of our listeners. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll wrap this up. Thank you again. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone for next episode soon. Thank you.